Hello, um, my name is Chandler DeMeo. Uh, I'm from the Atatiki Museum, and I would like to welcome y'all to our conference and our presentation. And uh, we're going to be showing y'all a mess director, Mr. Oliver Wareham. And they're also going to play some videos showcasing some of our exhibits that we have here on campus. And I hope y'all enjoy. Come, come, sit by the fire with me and so we can get to know each other. My name is Gordon Oliver Warham. I'm a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. I'm from the Panther Clan. I am the director for the Athotiki Museum, and I want to welcome you to this Seminole Tribal People's Museum located here on the Big Cypress Reservation. We would like to welcome you to the Pass Forward Online Conference sponsored by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Thank you for choosing this session, Athotiki Museum, a discussion with the Seminole Tribe. Welcome and come on in. My name is Cypress Billy. I'm a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. I come from the Longtail Panther Clan. I'm a museum educator here at the Thothiki Museum. I'm also a member of the Longtail Panther Clan. Currently, I work here at the Thothiki Museum as a museum educator. Well, from the beginning of time, I can't tell you then because I was only born 26 years ago. But the things that I do know about the campfire is that, you know, not only does it provide us with warmth, but it also provides a lot of nourishment to our camp itself. Whenever you lie within a, um, a current establishment, it purifies the area. It, um, it offers a cleansiness to the area around you. It gives a good aura. It also resembles uh, an occupation to the spirits that have moved on to the other side. And that's what a campfire means to me. The, um, our people say that the campfire in our relationship to it is it's our grandfather. There are stories that tell about as, it, as an older man, how he would transform into the fire. But I guess that's a story for another time. Along with it, that you would feed it um, tobacco and you also feed it the spleen of a deer or any other animal that you can um, provide, you can go and hunt, and you can um, give it that specific organ. Usually it's the people that reside within the, the camp itself. Um, the camp itself belongs to the oldest woman, and the oldest woman would be your grandmother, or it could be your mother if her mother has moved on. The campfire is fulfilled, and um, the people that upkeep it are usually the people that live within the area of the camp itself. Within a camp, there could be several families that live within a certain area or like a compound of, some, of such. But with it, whoever is up to the task of going and tending to the fire, of keeping it, getting the wood for it, and putting it in are the ones who attend to it, just whoever's available. There's no specific um, roles, like you're the fire person, you have to do it every day. It, whoever's around can um, keep feeding it wood as it goes through. No, not like an open flame, they usually have embers, and the embers is uh, still alive. The importance of the fire is everything that brings the camp together is the heart of the camp. It's what gives it, um, it's like its own entity. It, it's its heart, it allows everything to flow. Whenever you gather around it, you know, it offers a cleansiness, and also it's just a, a good area to be around. Whenever it brings people together, definitely it does. But more than anything, it's all for storytelling, for cooking, for even just sitting around. It's a hub, it's a space that you come to and that's how you go about of learning how your, your grandparents were. It's a sense where you can actually come and sit down and talk to them. Everything about our seminal people, you know, up until recent times that we have began writing things down but before then, everything has been passed down orally from uh, word of mouth, from um, 
a grandfather to his son to uh, me as his his nephew and as that's how it goes down to my children and their children's children and that's how traditions are going to be passed down and that's the way it needs to be so you can also get an understanding of who your relatives are as opposed to i guess being infused into this age of technology you know it brings you together and this is all done around the campfire there's no one way of upholding a fire and each family does things differently just because my family and i learn a certain way does not mean that you're going to take these teachings to the next family over even if we're within the same family if that makes sense um you're always going to learn something new different stories from different clans right uh today in this age, we have several clans. We have eight that are recognized. And since I learned teachings from the panther and teachings from my father, who's a part of the bird, that luckily I'm able to learn from two different sides. But if you go out into other reservations or even other families, then you're gonna learn a different perspective. So always just be open-minded when it comes to teachings in general. Uh, hello, my name is Chandler DeMeo. I'm from the Hollywood Reservation, and I work out here at the Atatiki Museum in Big Cypress, and I'm a museum educator. And today I'll be talking about the evolution and history of patchwork and clothing. I'd say it started around the uh, 1500s when the first Spaniards came over here. Um, by then we were still just wearing uh, buckskin clothing, or uh, we'd weave it out of uh, palmetto stalks and leaves. If you look at the paintings of Osceola, Wildcat, Jumper, um, Billy Bowlegs, all these other uh, leaders that they've uh, taken the time to either make etchings, photographs, or paintings of, if you look at their coats and their shirts, a lot of them will have um, these small little stripes uh, that kind of zigzag, whether that be on their coat, their shirts, or whatever they're wearing. That's called applique. I'd say that's the earliest form of patchwork that we have. Um, and what you would do is you would get a base layer, like a thin uh, strip that you wanted to decorate. Then you would cut out some other material and then you would hand sew that in whatever pattern you wanted over that uh, small piece of material. Um, but from that, around the 1890s to 1900s, that turn of the century time, when we started coming out of our period of isolation, um, we started getting introduced to the hand crank sewing machines by Singer and we started uh, being able to trade for large bolts of fabric. So with that, we were able to express ourselves in a new art form called patchwork. So we were able to make clothes faster and easier, but we were also able to add more to them and decorate ourselves more. And a lot of the early patchwork designs came from uh, things that were around them, but a lot of them also came from uh, beadwork designs that had been around for a couple hundred years already. So designs like animals, plants, um, Things that they saw every day around them that they had already transferred over to beadwork, some of them were able to transfer over to patchwork. Um, men's style is usually uh, one piece, while women's are usually um, two. So women usually wear um, the cape, uh, which is that top part that goes to about um, their stomach. Or um, they also wear the skirt, but there's different styles of skirts as well. Uh, men usually wear um, just one piece, whether that be a shirt, a vest, a big shirt, a long shirt. Um, a medicine coat. The patchwork that you see on my jacket is, um, this one's actually just a decorative style. So they've taken a lot of tiny little strips and sewn them together to create a pattern that they like, but it has no meaning behind it. Uh, this one, I've only ever heard it referred to as chevrons, but I know they got it from the uh, soldiers that they were fighting during the war. They see sergeants or lieutenants or people like that with these uh, stripes on their shoulders, so they started imitating that. Uh, so this is actually called rickrack. Um, it's just something that they would see at trading posts or stores that they like sewing. Um, there's actually a big shirt over here with a very large piece of uh, rickrack, which is actually a very early form of it. Uh, it wasn't until later on they started making smaller ones, like you see here. It's just a big part of self-expression and uh, artistry. So wherever you look at, um, whether it be wood carving, basket weaving, um, canoe making, even chicky building. These are all art forms that people take a lot of pride in. You don't realize how much work goes into um, something like that.
My name is Gordon Oliver Warham. I am director for the Athothica Museum and I am from the Panther Clan. Uh, we are here at the Legends Theater. Uh, this is where we do our oral history and storytelling. Now, storytelling uh, in our history is very, very important to be told orally. Uh, most of our uh, lessons that we tell is oral. It's not written down. So for myself, I am a storyteller for my tribe. Uh, I learned a lot of my stories from my Aunt Carol Cyprus. Um, and so to have a place like this to pass on our knowledge, especially to our young ones, is what we did. Uh, this, this from generation to gener generation, so passing down our knowledge and our experience to make sure that what makes us Seminole uh, continues from one generation to the generations. Um, so the story that we tell mostly here is by Betty Mae Jumper. She was from the Snake family. Uh, it's the corn lady or the corn woman. Uh, the story is very, very important to my people. Uh, the story is uh, told uh, from different clans and how it's being told uh, depends. But each one has that uniqueness that we have so we can actually explain the origin of our corn dance. Betty Mae Jumper, she was a very, very important person to my tribe. Not only was she a storyteller, but in the late 60s, uh, she was our first woman chairman, especially in that day, to have a woman as your uh, leader was special. And this was, she was a special woman. So not only was she a storyteller and our first trim woman, but she also was a nurse, uh, an alligator wrestler, and also our first editor of the Samoa Tribune. So she was an incredible woman. And for her to have some video here of her actually telling our stories, to the next generation and passing on that knowledge is very, very uh, vital. Having that knowledge passed from generation to generations and adding our experience to that knowledge and passing that to the next generation is vital. This is how we link to each other from generation to generation, from mother to child, from father to child, and then they pass on that knowledge. It's what makes us Seminole. So more, most of the time we told stories is at, at nighttime. Uh, this is uh, usually there will be one storyteller per family, uh, per clan, uh, that would gather the children around a fire and they would tell stories in a cypress dome. And the storyteller would use the cypress dome as his amphitheater. Uh, he would speak out in the, into this, into this, this dome and it will carry his voice throughout the, the dome. So he did not need to shout, but he would use that fire as part of his instrument because it would create shadows. And he would use those shadows to help tell the story uh, of the characters. So it became a theater for the, the camp. But at nighttime, when the little ones were sleeping or about to sleep, you would have the mothers, the uncles, the fathers come and tell a story. And they would tell stories to them, not just to uh, get them to go to sleep, it, but it will also uh, reinforce those stories, those legends, those knowledge uh, when those children were sleeping. Those, those words of wisdom, when they're falling and sleeping, will be the last things they heard for that night. So we all know that the things you hear last or the things you hear will remember. So this was very, very important at this time, at nighttime, that the last things they heard were the wisdom from the elders. So we have temporary exhibits here at the Athothic Museum, whether it's alligator wrestling or we just brought down an exhibit by Elgin Jumper. Um, right now we have an exhibit with uh, school kids from the Afoski. Uh, this is a form of storytelling. This is a form of expressing yourself and being inspired by one's culture. Uh, so whether it's a painting, whether it's a drawing, whether it's silver uh, making, you know, how one express themselves is a form of storytelling and, and putting that, that knowledge and that love of oneself and one's culture and one's tradition and showing that to the world that we are still here and how we express that being of here whether it's in Florida, whether it's in the United States, or whether it's in this world, is vital. You know, it's, you know, they call us the unconquer. They call us un the undefeated.
how one expresses himself, whether it's in Florida, whether it's in the United States, or whether it's in the world, you know, how we express ourselves, how we show ourselves to this world is, is important. Having a love for oneself, one's culture, one's tradition, and expressing that self to not just a, a few, but showing the world that we are still here. We are still unconquered. We are still undefeated. And showing that through art, showing that our stories are still alive is vital to us surviving. Hello, my name is Cypress Billy. Currently I work here at the Athaki Museum as a museum educator. I currently reside out here in Big Cypress, Florida. It's a lovely place. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking about stickball and what it is for our people. Stickball itself, uh, many moons ago, was only played by men. On an erected pole here, that's how the Seminoles play. There's other, there's many ways of playing ball, but this is how we play. These sticks here, they usually crafted out of cypress or willow, anything that has like a straight grain. Um, sometimes they use them as palmetto stalks if um, they need a temporary, temporary pair. But more than anything, um, they go about it and they carve it down to the shape of their liking. And um, depending on how old they are, because little boys can play too, that, that's what this, I guess, how do you say, determines the size of how, the, um, how big the rackets are too. Before women were allowed to play, that um, this was a sport only played by men. And it was used to dispute or to handle disputes. They will settle it out. And um, many men were killed through the physical contact of, and the roughness of this sport as well. Then years later, we allowed women to come in. And uh, women, they don't play with their, they don't play with sticks at all. They play with their hands. Primarily it's played at ceremony times, but before it wasn't. Before it's just um, anytime you had a erected pole that you can go and play but you do have to upkeep it. This game is owned by the birds. It's, uh, anytime a game is started or anytime it's played, to have an official game, a bird has to start it and he'll go about instructing the people about the score and tell them to come on out. And, uh, and that's whenever they'll begin it. You give that respect to them because they're the ones who um, keep the game, to keep the ball. And they're the ones who allow us to play the sport. But of course you can just go and have scrimmages and just go and play. The men have to be more, more reserved have to be a little bit, watch how we handle ourselves out there so you don't over whack them or hit them on the head or whatnot. But the woman, they can uh, pick you up, throw you on the ground, scratch you, uh, trip push you. Really, they're the ones who are the, the brutal ones. And there's no rules, there's no time limits, there's no um, perimeter, there's no out of bounds, how you would say. And um, yeah, you just go until you score. In the beginning, of the, each game, they'll come up with uh, deciding how many points should be scored throughout the entire game. It's uh, men against women. Games can last anywhere from 10 minutes to 45 to an hour, depending on how many people are out there, if there's a good score, if there's not. So it really depends on the people who are playing. The objective of uh, playing stickball is trying to get this ball and scoring um, the predetermined points that you have. You'll get those, the men will get, use their sticks and throw the ball as best as they can to try to hit it. Sometimes it floats random, but as you get more skilled, then you'll be able to hit it. The woman, um, they'll do the same thing. The objective of the game is to hit the, the pole above the marker with the ball, but you're trying to score points without allowing the other team to score. The Green Cornet Celebration is a time for self-reflection. It's a time for learning. It's also a time to put all the work that you learn from our songs to work. You allow the people to come around and dance by singing to them, and you'll teach them your ways of how you were learned. And if you were wrong, then you can be corrected or learn other ways about the song. There's more story that can be added on. It's a time of, um, it's a time of joy, a time of happiness. You get to see people that you haven't seen all year because they live all, um, all around. They have their own lives that they're going through, their paths, their careers that they have to tend to, their families they have to tend to. So whenever people come out to the Green Corn Dance, it's really a time to relax, but also at the same time, 
it's also a time to work as well, to work with, uh, I guess, your fellow brethren. Each um, grounds itself has its own aura, has its own feeling behind it, and it also has to do with um, the surrounding areas that you're coming from, whether that's in the Pinelands or in the Cypress Marshes. You really, you get a sense of the area itself as it's its, its own living being, but then the people also make it up too. So each corn dance is different. Each corn dance has its own uh, vibrations, how you would say. And they have different smells. Um, of course, the wood is different and the way people cook is different as well. Hello, good morning. My name is Cypress Billy. I'm a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. I belong to the Panther Clan. Today I'm gonna to be talking about the clans here, the Seminole Tribe. Today we recognize eight of them. That's going to be the Panther, the Wind, Bird, Snake, Deer, Bear, Otter, and the Big Town. There used to be several more, but whenever the reorganization happened in the, in the early 20s, then we all started being generalized and put into um, one, one big clan. There used to be several cats that are now just panther and several birds that are just bird. We also have another one called Tukushashi, which isn't recognized, but they are another clan. Clans are only given to us by our mothers, and the only, that's the only way you're gonna be given one. You're born into this life, and you're born into having a clan. Each clan are your family members. Your family members are, would be your grandpas, uncles, aunts, uh, nieces and nephews, and those are gonna be your siblings as you go through this life. Whenever it comes to partnering up and finding a, a mate, then you'll seek out another clan, and you're not to intermingle with your own. You're not to have children with your own, and you're not to have any relationships or intimate relationships with your own clan. That's um, considered incest. And back then, these are strictly taboo, and you would be punished accordingly. Today, since people do go outside the tribe and they, um, men have children and their, their children are born without clans and they try to participate and still um, claim being Seminole, they are, but they just have no clan. And that creates a lot of tension for them throughout their life because there's a lot of things where they can't do culturally and with practicing our traditions. I'm only familiar with um, my clan and the Panther, they're in charge of of keeping the bundle. They're the ones who tend to the medicine, and they're the ones who go out and um, train other clans to practice this medicine. There's other clans that do uh, practice, don't get me wrong, but they all learned it from a panther from way back when. The bird clan itself, they're the ones in charge of the green corn dance. They're the ones who help facilitate it, and they're the ones who maintain the grounds. They're the ones who um, own the game of ball that allow us to play. and. Those are some of the duties that they, they tend to. It comes from our creation stories and how we came out of our egg um, a few creations ago. And that, those are where our clans came from, of being seminal. I was told that the bird were, um, was trying to peck out the egg and wasn't strong enough. So the wind had came along and made a tornado and burst it out, came back in, the bird flew out, and then the panther followed suit. The creator had intended the panther to come out first, but he had a big old head and wasn't, um, wouldn't be able to fit out. From there, all other clans followed suit. And um, so I was told that the bird, or the wind came out first, the bird flew out, then the panther followed uh, behind the three. And those are our three major clans with the, um, the wind, bird, and panther. The other clans, they follow under the panther and the wind. There's um, the otter, the big town, the snake, they fall under wind category, and they're the ones who are like the water creatures or the amphibians or the ones who fly in the air. Bird falls under that category too. And under the panther would be the deer, um, the bear, and um, I think that's it. There's um, just the ones who crawl on the land, and the other ones are the ones who um, fly by the air or the ones that are in the water. That's um, what the bird does. But it all comes through just our creation story. Keeping your clan traditions alive during this modern sense is very important because we're in this time where people are losing their identity. Um, there's a lot of people that don't speak the language anymore or nor practice their own traditions. 
Um, Christianity has really influenced us and that's a good way it puts them on the righteous path but with up upholding our own traditions it's um, it's deteriorating our people in a regard of wanting to practice and further it I'm not too sure how it's going to be in a hundred years after I'm gone but that's um, I guess those are kind of the things that we face and it's all upholded by keeping your clans and the traditions within your clan alive and um, we're an oral based we're oral based people, so we have to pass our traditions down and not write it down for them to learn through a book. It's all done through talking to one another and allowing our young and our youth to be intelligent in that way from just teaching them firsthand. Coming from a large clan myself, there are many families that make up one particular clan and it's the same for the bird and wind. Although that we're all family, that they're quite distant from one another and there can also be feuds that lie within the same clan as well that are still around today, and that's okay, you know, all families fight, but we're all um, share the same bloodline and we all come from the same people. So we give each other that mutual respect to carry on and move forward. Hey, good afternoon. Um, if you can hear me, we're coming to you live from the Seminole Tribe of Florida's amazing Big Cypress uh, Reservation. My name is Paul Backhouse. I'm the Senior Director of the Heritage and Environment Resources Office and also the Tribe's Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, which is a mouthful. Um, and I'm really happy to be here this afternoon. We're, I'm, I've, I've been humbled to, to, drive, to, to work for the Seminole Tribe for the last 15 years. And we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon and have a discussion about the work that we do. Um, and that was the first time we've seen those videos and they were amazing. So um, really appreciated watching those uh, with you guys as well. Those guys did an incredible job. Um, I'm just gonna introduce uh, my colleagues that I'm here with this afternoon to have this discussion. Uh, so you've heard about me, I will pass the bat on to Quinton. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry. Quinton, you might be having some technical difficulties. I think we'll, you might want to reverse your camera. I think it's looking uh, at the, the computer screen there. Ah, there you hey. are. Sorry, right, it's trying to. Uh, can you guys hear me fine? Yeah. Okay. In Cyprus. I'm from the Seminole Tribe of Florida. I work I work with a thousand key music. Our tribes are about The, the audio is cutting out a little bit on your uh, queue, unfortunately, for some reason. Um, see if you can give it a tweak, and I'll pass the bat on to, to Dave while you're you're tweaking the, the audio. Dave. Hi, <clears throat> hi. My name is Dave Shedeker. I'm the historian for the Salt Tribe Florida Tribal Historic Preservation Office. I am not a tribal member. I am just really, really honored to have this job and be able to work here and do this. Um, I don't know really what more to say beyond that. Uh, I've been working for a tribe for seven and a half years now. I started as a archeologist and worked my way up. Excellent, thank you, Dave. And uh, Chandler, we, we obviously heard a little bit about you, but would you like to add anything else by way of introduction? Chandler, can you can you hear us? Oh, sorry. Um, hi, my name is Chandler DeMeo. Uh, I'm a tribal member for the Seminole Tribe of Florida, and I grew up on the Hollywood Reservation, but I work here on the Big Cypress Reservation and at the Atalthiki Museum, a museum educator. So if there's ever something that um, somebody requests a speaker for, uh, it's usually through my department or it's a tour around the facilities. That's usually also my department as well. Excellent. Thank you, Chandler. 
And just to let folks know, um, we're getting ready today for our biggest celebration of the year. So it's our American Indian Arts Celebration that kicks off tomorrow. So we're looking forward to welcoming several thousand people to the big Cypress Reservation tomorrow. Um, just out my window here, I can see tents going up and things happening, tribal vendors, community members getting excited about this. So if you're in South Florida or in Florida, or you want to make a trip here this weekend, we'd love to see you uh, on the Big Cypress Reservation. Um, Quinton, do you want to check check your audio real quick, see if, see if we got you? Yep, can you guys hear me? Perfect, yep. man, perfect. Would you like to just do a, a, a second introduction? Yes, sorry, I know I was on my phone, I was trying to switch over to this laptop, but this laptop took like 50 years to upload everything. <laughs> Anyways, so yes, my name is Quentin Cypress. I'm a Seminole tribe member. I'm from the Big Cypress Reservation. Um, I'm the Community Engagement Manager for the Heritage and Environmental Resource Office. Uh, we're an umbrella department over the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, the Athothiki Museum, and the Environmental Resource Department. And I guess to give you a little bit of background of who the Seminole tribe is, um, the Seminole tribe uh, is from around here, Florida. We say our ancestral lands go all the way up towards Tennessee. Um, obviously with colonization and all this stuff, were placed in certain states and they say that's where we're from realistically there's no borders we have no fences back in the day you know our ancestral lands are all over the place you know we didn't want to deplete a food source so we didn't stay in one spot we didn't just kill everything that was there anyways so um fast forward a little bit before you know we get a little complicated about how the tribe works and how we're you know come about the Europeans or the U.S. government started calling us the Seminole tribe of Florida um, before uh, we're a mixture. We'd say we're kind of a mixture of different tribes. We all believe in the same. We all have our same culture. Um, so eventually during the wars when we were fighting, uh, we just got lumped together and called the Seminole tribe. Uh, during the Indian Removal Act, um, I forgot the exact year, so that day is better with the years. Um, but in 1957, Okay, in 1957, we formally became recognized as the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Um, a bunch of our leaders uh, put together enough funds. They were able to travel in one vehicle all the way up to Washington, D.C., and we were able to get, you know, whatever paperwork and stuff that we needed in place to be recognized as a sovereign nation. Um, you know, to add to that, uh, during we had the U.S. government says we had three wars and we don't look at it as that. We look at it as one long war with the U.S. government, and it's a war that we say actually never ended, and that's why we call ourselves the Unconquered Seminole Tribe. And we're going to talk about a little bit more why we're unconquered, talking about Egmont Key today. So I'll go ahead and pass it over to you guys. Excellent introduction, Quentin. Thank you. And background of history. So you know the Seminole Tribe is a sovereign government, and acts accordingly so you know this idea of being a sovereign is really important and the truck within the tribal governmental structure there's around 70 or so departments uh, and as we mentioned you know dave works for the thpo quinton and i work with the heritage and environment resources office chandler works with the atafiki museum so it's a governmental structure and I, I think people outside of a tribal structure often perhaps forget that with historic preservation and you know send a letter directly to the chairman for instance um you know saying here's my section 106 compliance issue or whatever it might be um so just we wanted to point that out that there's the structure within the tribe and it works like a, a sovereign government um and we consult on a government to government basis um so we'd expect that you know when uh, an agency is consulting with the seminal tribe the the same standing of person on the seminal tribe side is meeting with the official on the other side so a like for like representation would be the chairman of the seminal tribe meeting with the president of the united states that is a like for like consultation does it ever happen? No, it doesn't, but that is how that should work. Um, so we're here today to talk about one specific preservation issue that we've been working at for several years, and we thought it would be a great case study just discuss 
take some questions from the audience and just share with you. Dave, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to kind of sketch the background of, of Egmont and um, why is that so important and, and what, what it's all about. Okay. Um, Egmont Key, it's a project that we've been working on here for five or six, well, no, even longer. I found out recently it came to the attention of the Historic Preservation Office in 2011 with Section 106 compliance. It's an island off of the coast of Tampa. It's actually right in the mouth of Tampa Bay. And because of that, it's getting all the tile action. It's, it's visited very often. It's not very large. And historically, when we go back um, and look at it over the years, when you go all the way back to the time of the ancestors of Seminole who were here, um, it was used pretty much the same way it is today. It's not large enough to live on. There's not enough. There's not a fresh water supply. There's not enough animals there. So what is a beautiful place to go visit, fish, camp out, and leave that's about all it got used for for a long time in uh the 1500s the french first mapped the area when they were coming around in the 1700s it was found by a man named don maria don maria de Sali, and he discovered the island along with tampa bay which he named uh, the spiritual santo and he did the most Spanish thing possible he claimed it for the King and Queen of Spain, planned a cross on it, named it for the two guys who funded his expedition and left. Um, after that, it was still traditional use. The The people who lived around the area made the most traditional use of it at the time were the Tokabaga. And they lived right off, right around the St. Petersburg Peninsula. We know mostly about them from Spanish records at the time and oral traditions passed down within the tribe. After that, it was found by a Scottish explorer who was funded by the English, who also found the island and named it for the guy who funded his expedition. The Earl of Egmont, who never visited, but has a nice island named after him, also has an, a mountain in New Zealand, but I'm um, digressing. So for a long time, this island, it, it was nice, people visited, wasn't much attention. When the U.S. started trying to shore up the fences and looking around the coast, a military survey found Egmont Key and a surveyor who, by the name of uh, Lieutenant Robert E. Lee, who would go on for some other things he become famous for later on, um, mapped it out and said that it would be a good place to put a base. It also then was slotted for a lighthouse. The lighthouse was put in in the 1840s, got knocked down the same year by the Great Gale of 1848. A second lighthouse was put up, but during this time, the Seminole War came around. Um, Seminole War, start, and as Quentin mentioned, it's often said to be three separate wars. And for the US, that's how it's measured because those are three times that war was officially declared in Congress. For a Seminole tribe, the war really started around 1811 with the Patriot War, an invasion of militias from Alabama and Georgia who were backed by the federal government that were trying to take Florida. Um, as part of that group, they attacked Seminole uh, towns around Alachua. The war broke out from there with Andrew Jackson's invasion. The Indian Removal Act kicked it back into high gear. And it went on for almost half almost half a century of basically constant warfare for members of the tribe and while the tribe did incredibly well for most of the war it was a battle of attrition and the u.s could keep cycling troops in and out whereas the seminole tribe every loss was an incredibly huge loss they started with a few thousand and they were facing basically tens of thousands with unlimited people coming back in the U.S. did badly in the during the middle phase of the war because they didn't know how to fight in the swamp. They didn't know how to fight guerrilla tactics anymore, but they learned a lot of those lessons. So when it came down to the 1850s and the end, uh, tactics were changed a lot. They were they stopped trying to use cavalry in the swamp, for one thing. They uh, started using boats, and they learned not to engage the tribal mem the the warriors, the soldiers of the tribe directly if they could. Instead, they started attacking camps, where the women, children, elders, non-combatants, injured people would be found. They started rounding up these people. Um, 
hold him captive first at Fort Myers, but Fort Myers proved the place that they were generally easy, easily able to escape from. So they looked back at the records and found that they and found Igmont Key. So it was ordered to have a prison built there for Seminole detainees, the people captured, the civilians captured from these camps. The place was funded, built with a blockhouse for um, troops were stationed there. And they started bringing the women, children, elders there to be held. There were a few hundred that passed through there at least. They would occasionally find someone who spoke enough English to give a message, usually a woman, to release, take back to the mainland, release, and tell her to find Billy Bullock and his people to relay a message to them that your families are being held at are being held by the US government. They are going to be sent to Oklahoma. If you want to be with them, you should surrender. This proved a very effective tactic, and Billy Bullings and many of the people following him in 1858 turned themselves into U.S. government at Fort Myers. They were taken to Igmont Key. There was one night where everybody stayed there, reunited with their families, and then they were taken off by a ship called the Gray Cloud to Fort New Orleans to be sent up to Oklahoma for the to the Seminole Reservation there. After after that period, um, the U.S. didn't have much time to celebrate. That, well, they declared victory in the Seminole War at that point, even though there were still hundred, a few hundred Seminoles still in Florida. They didn't have much time to celebrate because the Civil War broke out. Egg Mikey became important in that as part of the Union's Anaconda plan. It then was later militarized completely with a base during the, well, for the Spanish-American War, but it was completed, it was started in the Spanish-American War and completed 14 years later. Um, that war was, that base was then decommissioned after the First World War. Since then, it's become a state park. The White House now operate, was operated by the Coast Guard. And we were called back, we found out about a lot of this history when a Section 106 process went through to try to save the island because it is currently washing away due to both erosion and climate change. That was in 2011. A lot of research went through to find um, the full history of the area. And we've had a great working relationship with people there, and that brings us to today. Thank you, Dave. That's a great synopsis. So just, you know, for the audience, it's really important to consider here that this is a hidden history. This isn't in a history book that you could pick up at school. This isn't a history that's taught. This is a, a hidden history that's, you know, pretty disturbing when you hear the details of it. So strangely, you know, from the Army Corps asking us about putting sand on the beach at Egmont for Section 106, these things have come to light through, you know, the oral histories of the tribe, through our own research, that are now going back to tribal members because they don't know what happened to their ancestors that were taken away from Florida because they're the ones that remain. So connecting with this island has become a critical part of what the Historic Preservation Office is and does. And Quinton, I'm going to pass the baton to you because you've been critical in, in taking people out to that island and connecting them with that space. What What's that experience been like? And how does it make you feel when you're out on the island? Yeah. Um, so to the thing you said earlier about, you know, this is hidden history. Well, that's like most American history, right? <laughs> most of it's tucked away and hidden or, you know, or told on TV that America's not built on stolen land, things like that. So, you know, when it comes to Egmont Key, um, I see one of the questions on here um, on the message board, you know, it asks, uh, are we related to the folks in um, Oklahoma? So, yeah, the um, the uh, Egmont Key, you know, like I said, it was an island that they held us during the Indian Removal Act, and they were shipping us off to Oklahoma. Um, they would... Like Dave was telling you, they caught the elderly, they caught the young, and the wounded or the injured, um, the ones that couldn't really, you know, fend for themselves. And when they would take them towards Egmont or to Egmont Key, um, obviously they were left with nothing. But the U.S. wanted to take more of us, and not just the injured that they captured. They wanted to remove all of us, you know. So they figured out how to get into, you know, get inside, try to get inside our heads a little bit. So they started sending the elderly or the young 
back into um, the mainland and send them back to find us and let tell us with or send them with a message saying that if you don't come with us, you'll never be able to see you know your mom or your grandma or your sons or daughters again. And so that got inside of a lot of people's heads, and so it, some of them ended up going. But a lot of us knew that, you know, no matter what, we had to fight the fight. So a lot of us stayed. Um, the ones that did go, some of them died on the island. Some of them died on the ships because they got sick. When you go to the island, you won't see a lot of history or a lot of um, recordings of that. They don't talk about how we died or how we were murdered or any of that kind of stuff. So that won't be out there either. Um, you know, one of the folks I guess we'll get to here in a little bit is uh, Polly Parker. Um, she's a very significant um, person for us. She's one of the only people to escape from Egmont Key. And the way she did that was when they shipped her off towards um, Louisiana, because that was our next stop after Egmont Key. Um, right somewhere in between there, northern Florida, she she come up with um, a plan, a plan to get some of them off the ship. And the way she did that was when they got uh, a little bit northern Florida, as the story kind of goes from our side, is that she told the soldiers that one of the ladies was sick and they needed medicine, but the medicines that they need are right on the shoreline. So if you can just take us there, we can get her situated and get back on and go. And so when they pulled off, there was a group of six ladies um, that went out to go get the, the medicines. And the soldiers obviously followed them. So they told the soldiers, you know, you, you can't look at the medicines that we're going to do um, because they would kind of taint what we're doing. And so they use that as opportunity to run off on foot. And they're way up on northern Florida. They're on the panhandle. And they walked. So they did escape. And they walked from way up there almost towards like, um, you know, yeah, Tallahassee, the Tallahassee area, all the way back down to right where Lake Okeechobee is. You know, I think there was a group of what six women that were able to walk all the way back, and Polly Parker was able to lead that. So she's a very significant person to us, and because of her, there's you know, a lot of us are able to. Uh, there's a lot of descendants of her today. Um, she was able to, you know, alone. Just that alone helped save the numbers of our people for the similar tribe. And I know, Paul, you asked, what is it, how does it feel for me to go back out there? A lot of, uh, when we go out there, there's been a lot of news uh, channels that like talking to us and like talking about Edmont Key. That's one of the common questions I get from them. And I always tell them, you know, they always ask me is, um, do you feel sad or depressed when you're out there because of the history? And I always tell them, no, I feel proud and I feel happy because of the people who we are. We fought hard just for us to be here still and we're able to go back to that island at any time we want go over there get on the ferry eat a couple of snacks bring the beach chair if we want you know we can go and enjoy ourselves on this island that they tried to hold us captive on but we're still here able to tell that story and that's what we're doing you know the island is eroding away and there's a lot of things we can take from that like climate change and um the human destruction of the land but for us personally when we're asked do we want the island to be saved we say no but we want the story the history of the island to be saved and so that's why we're talking about egmont key here today that's why we're talking about um the history of it and that we got magazines on it we do um stories me and dave and i do um, interviews with news channels all the time about egmont key and it's important for us to get this message out there for one, there's a lot of people in this world who still don't know or still don't believe us Native Americans are still alive and here today. I don't know how many times people come up and ask, are you really Native American? And I tell them, yeah. And, you know, the response usually I'll get is, well, you don't look Native. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not wearing a big fancy headdress and everything. And, you know, I'm not wearing my loincloth because I'm not from the Western tribes that you see on TV. That's the stuff that they portray as Native American. The Native American is different, you know. Native American is actually a term that comes from the U.S. We're indigenous to these lands, and we were always here and will always be here. Um, so that's why it's important for us to get these messages out there so people know, and so that way this history doesn't happen again. 
so that way we don't lose our lands again. And we're confined to these small reservations. We're confined to this land that we're told to live on. And, you know, like I said before, our ancestral lands go all the way up towards Tennessee. You know, we've traveled all over the world. That's from our oral histories. And again, so to answer your question, Paul, it's, I, I feel proud to be back on the island. Thank you, Quentin. That's a really great and honest answer. Um, so in terms of, you know, when we think about preservation, we usually think about preserving something at one time period, right? When you try and preserve a place, you're thinking about a particular time that that place was important and you try and make it all look like that particular time. What you're presenting, what, what we're discussing is something very different, right? The way the tribe's historic preservation office and the tribal community think about this space and want to share the story about this space isn't necessarily for a particular time to, to bring it back to that time to keep it at that time it's to project it forward to future generations of tribal members so that they know what happened there dave can you can you expand upon that a bit what how is that different i, I can see in the chat we've got some folks from shippos and things on on this discussion, how, how does the TIPO differ in how you we approach historic preservation? I'd say one of the main things is we're, we're working for the community that we're trying to preserve the history of. So we've got, there's an investment in there and there's hopefully as we talk to people, a good understanding that comes. Again, I'm not tribal, I rely on uh, Quentin Chandler uh, people to help me understand what it is that the tribal, the indigenous community actually wants done. And part of that with Big Marquis is because it's at risk, because it's going away, and because um, for the beliefs of a lot of people, it it shouldn't be changed. You let nature take its course. What we had to look at was how do we keep the story alive? Quite eventually, keep the story alive. The place isn't what's important. What happened there is, so we approach this. Um, first off, there's a book that we put together. It's, it's a short book. It's more like a natural geographic or so, but. Um, there's a link to that that's on the National Trust page that Priya shared, and yeah, that's it, Paul's holding there. Um, it tells a lot of the story. It was written, it was put out for free so people can understand for the community, but also for anyone who wants to get a look and try to get a better understanding of the, tribes, the tribal view on this. We've also been working with um, the 3D lab from USF to go out there and do digital scanning of the area of the island so that for elders who can't get out there and for future generations who might never have the chance they can actually get the experience but yeah we had them out here a couple of weeks ago actually got the great experience of putting on vr uh equipment and looking around in my key from there um and see what kind of future stuff is available we're working also with um the chart group which is putting together a learning app for kids doing research on Florida area state parks that are important to various groups and studies that are at risk of climate change and to help do that. So we're, we're really trying to take an incredibly, um, an incredibly modern approach to this to make sure that this knowledge will not be lost and that the as much of the experience can be shared as possible. It's a great summary, Dave. And um, I think it's, it's different to I think how a lot of people approach what we do. Um, Quinton, I know we're, we're starting to, to run down on, on time here, but you know, we, I just want to go back to your community. Uh, you, the, what you do and you and Dave do is take community members out to the island, right? To experience it and to talk about, you know, what happened there. Yeah, I, I know you've had, you've, you've had several people that are actually descendant of Polly Parker on on those tours that they, they didn't even know. Can you can you describe what that I was there for one of those and it it was really quite a moving experience. Can you can you just kind of describe that a little for the for the audience? Yeah of course. Yeah apologies for you asked that kind of got carried away. Um so you know one of the biggest things that we're trying to do to get um uh the history of this island preserved for us, you know, I'm only 27 so when we started going out here on this island and learning about the stuff, and I kind of started bringing the, uh, the history back to some of our tribe members, you know, we presented at uh, community events. A lot of our elders actually didn't know the history of the island. A lot of them didn't even know anything about the island. And there were some who heard mention of it, but not too much about it afterwards. You know, we tried 
uh, looking up a name for the island of what we would have caught it back in the, in the day. We would have just called it like the dark place. And that's all people really remembered about it. So it as the community engagement coordinator at the time, I was just the coordinator. Um, you know, I was asked to help try to get community trips to get them out there to help, um, you know, just to get them out there and see the island. Then eventually we realized it's, it's, it's a deeper thing. It's a thing we need to really get more tribal, more of our tribal members out there and, you know, get them to remember that history. Because for me, from my perspective, you know, I'm trying to be a leader within my own community and make sure that our people don't forget about these things as well. You know, not to get too caught up in today's, you know, latest trends and things like that, you know, getting stuck on social media. So getting them out to experience the island and, and see where we, you know, where our tribe and where our people came from. Um, so we're trying to get as much of our tribe members out there. We're about 4,200 tribe members strong. Um, and we've only gotten maybe some 80 folks out there, maybe just over 80 folks. We're still under 100, I'm sure. So, you know, my, my big goal, and I think our big goal is to try to get at least, at least half of our tribe out there. You know, and that's obviously a big goal and trying to get that um, done. The, the ferry can only hold up what's like 30 something people, you said, Dave. So <laughs> you do the math on how many times that's going to take and how much money that might take. But um, trying to get them out there um, as much as we can before the island erodes away. I mean, there's talk about the um, that Tampa Bay area getting dredged even more so these super cargo ships can come by. Well, the island's eroding away at a faster rate than it was back in the day because it got dredged before. So if they dredge it again, so bigger ships would come by, what's that going to mean? It's going to mean that island is going to wash away even faster. So, you know, it's important for us to get the um, autonomous over there as much as possible. And we have even had, you know, criminal Oklahoma tribe members uh, come down and visit us at the island as well. And they've had separate stories, stories that they've heard passed down from generation. Um, so it's important from all these aspects and from all these angles um, for us to get our people and other people out there. We frequently, these people that do um, interviews with us through the news channels, we invite them out there as well. And there, but, you know, broaden our reach with the story and all the other things that go on with the island. It's not just our history happening at the island. We also got... Um, you know, biodiversity that talk, talks about the birds and stuff that are out there. There's a big, uh, what, pelican sanctuary or something like that out there. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the biggest one in the, what'd you say, the southern hemisphere? You said that yesterday, Paul? So the, the biggest pelican uh, uh, sanctuary in the northern hemisphere. No, northern mm -hmm. hemisphere. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of things that go on there and there's a lot of things that can be caught out there. You know, our, our history obviously is a big deal because it's, for, you know, it's our history. And I want our people to know about it, because, but there's more to be taught going out to Egmont Key. You know, like I said, I kind of mentioned before, you know, human destruction, you know, that kind of adds on to climate change. Thank you, Quentin. And I know we're running out of time here. Um, that's a, a really good way to put a, a full stop on, on the, the discussion here, but a full stop just for this discussion. Um, you know, Egmont Key is just one of thousands and thousands and thousands of cultural sites that are connected with the indigenous past of where we live. And you can see just with this one story, what it means from a human experience standpoint, you know, whether that place exists or it doesn't exist. Amazingly, it got through Hurricane Ian unscathed. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, were, we were amazed by that. But thousands of sites face impacts from climate change they all have stories like these connected with them so we just wanted to share this one with you today so you can see some of the work that we do the tribal historic preservation office only has 20 people working within it and its job as quinton indicated covers southern florida all the way up to southern tennessee it's a lot of area to try and work with with these types of stories so we need all the allies that we can get and you know we appreciate the interest from the national trust we'd love to welcome you down to the big cypress uh, reservation so please do reach out to us reach out to quinton to dave to myself um and come down and see the museum here uh it's a beautiful installation and somewhere that you can visit and find more out about the story of the tribe so i know we're, we're out of time 
Um, but thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much to the panel, to Jamla, to Quinton, and to Dave. And uh, we look forward to connecting with you in the future. Yeah, thank you so much.